I'm Lauren Hubelay, and I'd like to welcome you to the How We Heal podcast. I'm here with two of my dear colleagues, Cameron Scott and Megan Limp, and we are discussing ways in which we can bring the best of Asian medicine, gemotherapy, and polyvagal theory together to illuminate a path for your healing. Um, today, we have some very special questions from our listeners, but before we get started, Megan, you had a very interesting idea last week to get us started. Yeah. Hi, Lauren and Cameron. It is a joy to be with you again. Thanks to everybody tuning in and um, getting to know their autonomic nervous systems on this path with us. I thought it would be great for us to start the beginning of our recording uh, since recently, we've been talking about tracking our own autonomic states. So I thought it might be nice for us to pause and just check in with ourselves as we start, just for a quick moment here. Wherever you are and whatever position you're in, just kind of pause for a moment and take a deep breath and feel your senses. So where you're sitting or what you're hearing what you're seeing, what your temperature feels like. Just knowing that however you're showing up for this practice today and this exploration is perfect. And um, we're gonna track our state. So I can share that in this moment, I am sitting in my new office. I feel pretty relaxed. Um, I am a little bit more flat than normal, maybe a touch of dorsal and a touch of ventral. I feel um, always a little underlying sense of joy when I join with these two beautiful co-hosts. Um, but I have had just a touch of congestion going on this week and um, a little bit fuzzy headed and flat. So um, that's where I'm at. I feel um, happy and also a little bit low. How about you two? Camping, how are you feeling? I love this invitation to just stop, to pause, to create a, a little bit of room to, to practice state tracking. And, and for me in this moment, I think there's always, as I fly through my morning and anticipate meeting with you both, I, I can feel that mobilized. And it, it what is that fine line between mobilized, excited, and mobilize like, oh, how, how am I gonna get there on time? <laughs> and then once I see your faces and, and I connect, I can just feel that ventral in, in terms of that an ease in my body and mm -hmm. just coming coming full, more fully into the moment. And it's like the ventral just comes in. I had a, a twitch of that sympathetic when I you started making, cause I'm like, opening up and then I hear sirens in the background and my neuroception is, wait a minute, is everything okay? I did a little sympathetic blip, <laughs> but then followed the, the moment and no, no danger. And, and my system could open up again to that. I feel my shoulders going down and my breath mm -hmm. my moving back into more ventral vagal. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Megan and Cameron. I, I, um, always have a, a great deal of uh, mobilized energy as we're coming into our sessions. Um, it's being here on time, it's um, getting our topic straight, and, and, and I'm thinking about, too, a little bit when I'm checking in my state, the more I have context about what we're going to talk about, the more ventral energy I can um, access. And, it, and it's interesting as we start, we come online together and we round out where we're going to head together. I can feel myself coming more into a place of ease. My heart rate might slow down together and it's a joyful mobilization, but it's still a mobilization. Yeah. And when I'm there, I might not be listening mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And um, I, I'm not picking up on all the subtleties of conversation. And, and so it, I find it 
um, very comforting when there's a little bit more spaciousness, as I'm sure both of you do. Um, yeah. So just talking about this brings me into a, a comfortable place where mobilize, but I can tap into that ventral energy. Yeah. You know, I think that just this moment that we've spent together right now is a great experience of what co-regulation is. If that word has still been elusive to you, um, you can feel that the three of us, you know, we started each in a little bit of a different place, but as we're showing up for each other and as you're listening and we're showing up for you and you're showing up for, for us, um, there is an opening and a softening and a welcoming to the present moment that just kind of naturally happens between us. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Megan, for taking us through that exercise. And that leads us right into this topic that we have been discussing for the past uh, couple episodes of state tracking, right? And we have given um, our ex shared our experiences in state tracking and, and understanding these three states of ventral our state of connection, sympathetic, this mobilized state where we um, begin to protect ourselves and start some disconnection because to protect ourselves, we do have to disconnect. And then that, that state of complete disconnection, but also conservation in our dorsal vagal state. And I, I received a couple questions this week from our listeners that I think could be um, very useful for everyone today. And they are about state tracking. And, and one of them is from a listener who shared, you know, I, I really get this state tracking. Um, I am able to notice and name my state throughout the day, but I'm finding that I get stuck and what next? What, what, what helpful thing can I do now that I notice my state? And, and the question came from specifically from a circumstance um, this listener was experiencing in her own life as um, mom to a new baby, having younger children at home and um, dealing with that integration of, okay, I love this blissful state of breastfeeding and I'd love to be in that little bubble. And yet there's a toddler running around my house that's very unpredictable and, um, or very predictable, but the minute I sit down to nurse, um, he's going to want my attention, but also he can do that in an aggressive way towards me and the baby and then I find myself in a state of protection. So the big question ladies is great we've got this state thing down but then what? Mm. But then what? And that's that moment that when our neuroception kicks in our, our biology through our internal senses and our environment and engagement with another autonomic nervous system, if the neuroception is of some cue or danger or threat, that question, am I okay? Is the situation okay? Gonna biologically need to be addressed before we can have uh, some influence uh, on our states. So it makes sense. Here's this wonderful scent, state of, bliss, it's based on oxytocin and just a wonderful, probably, you know, combination of some wonderful ventral vagal energy, maybe some of that peaceful dorsal vagal energy. And then comes a hurtling other autonomic nervous system toward us. And there are hardwiring for that survival. It is not up for debate in that moment. It simply isn't. <laughs> Once we, answer the, the state of need to be safe, safe enough in that moment, then the return, hopefully sooner if we can go, okay, everything's fine, you know, bring that you know, neuroception up to explicit. It's like, oh, we're all, we're all fine. There's no real cue for danger. Once we get, we get that ventral vagal influence back on again, then we can start to imagine 
how might we do this another time? How might I influence this, you know, circumstantially another time? But only when we've risen to enough ventral vagal energy can that question be, you know, addressed with compassion, with curiosity, you know, all the, the wonderful attributes of just enough ventral vagal and not being in survival state. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like one of the questions for us to explore is, um, you know, she's doing a beautiful job of state tracking. It sounds like she's aware of her neuroception, that she's going into a protective state, that that part is um, out of our control. Um, and so she's bringing that self-awareness to it. But it sounds like Cameron, from what you're saying, maybe the question is, she's curious about how does she welcome some ventral into that moment so that her engagement with the moment, her engagement um, in how she reacts and responds to her toddler and shows up for herself and multiple kids all at once, which is quite a wave to ride and it's a lot to get used to. Um, how does she open into that? I think that often there is a bit of um, a sense of healing for me just in knowing that when I'm state tracking and I remember that um, when I'm moving into a protective state, it's not a choice. There is actually something cathartic about that for me often because it feels like it opens up that moment and creates more spaciousness and time in there. And that almost feels like giving it context for me sometimes that I now understand sort of the framework of what's happening in that moment. We have discussed context as sort of creating this framework with which we can understand the situation. And so I think that's what's cathartic for me about offering myself compassion and understanding when I move into a protective state is that, okay, I've got this context. This is what's happening. I can see that now I've got a framework for it. But the question still remains, so now what? And in my memory of, uh, I have two boys, I'm a boy mom, and they're about three and a half years apart, a little less than that. So I was in this exact situation with nursing and having a toddler. And I remember that it was overwhelming. And I remember quite a lot of sympathetic moments like the listener is describing. And <clears throat> I remember that at times when my toddler would barrel towards me, it felt like I needed to armor against it and it was overwhelming. And at other times, the glimpse of his little um, cute brown eyes barreling towards me, I, I would melt and I could be, I could reach out that other arm that I wasn't holding uh, my infant with and um, give him a quick 10 seconds of tickle or playfulness or just something so he could feel connected and then run away. And the truth is, is that's not always possible. And um, that sounds great when I'm saying it. And many of my moments didn't look like that. Um, but I'm only mentioning it because the fact that I dipped my toe into it and I experienced it once or twice lets me know that changing our perception of that um, when we can invite a little bit of ventral in is possible. So even if a small percentage of the time, the listener can tap into some playfulness, which is sympathetic mixed with ventral um, and share a quick moment uh, with her toddler um, and not always armor, or at least maybe armor in the moment and let it dissolve a little bit, that it, there is some possibility and spaciousness in there. Mm. I love that idea of bringing play in, Megan. And I, I can say that that was not something I could access very easily. No, neither could I. Yeah. It, it was, it's, it's, it's a beautiful concept. And now, you know, understanding how that can shift things and having all the, the wisdom of these years, that's, that makes sense. But in the moment, those split second moments, I think, you know, clearly this is challenging. Where I want to take this is something, an idea I've been working with. And, and that idea is that when we hit this um, state of, of 
disconnection, dysregulation, and we don't see a, a clear way out, we aren't biologically allowed that, that, that one of the things I believe we can access um, that, uh, in, in, in a very simple way is our senses. And, right. and we can bring in sensory pleasure. And I know for me, um, you know, having a soft blanket that I can touch, this is, this goes back to toddlerhood, but having something. And so even having a shawl on perhaps when this mother's nursing, that is something that could bring some sense of touch. Um, that's comforting if that sensory information is comforting for that mother. But maybe it's smell, maybe it's temperature, and it's, I mean, a cup of warm tea isn't exactly safe around a charging toddler. So, um, but in other times, that might be a, a useful tool, or having the window open just enough to hear the birds sing. Just one one movement of two degrees into a, a sensory experience that could bring pleasure, I found to be very useful to then be able to go, oh, maybe I can let some play in or something um, more suitable. You know, I think that there is an idea inside there that has a lot of potential, Lauren, that just occurred to me, which is I think I'm um, finding... Um, a sensory experience for both she and the toddler might work. For example, um, I think the base layer of acknowledging her own state and getting in touch with her own um, senses needs to be the foundation, like you said. But I do think uh, that it's possible to engage both of their senses in a way that softens. For example, if she held a soft teddy bear in her hand, she could kind of hold that out and kind of um, play with the toddler or protect against um, the barreling energy towards her in a way that still felt protective to her and playful and maybe soft and soothing to the toddler coming at her. I think there, or um, maybe held a blanket out or something soft that felt like um, a layer of protection to her, but also felt playful to, um, to cute little toddler. Um, I think that maybe there's some ideas in there um, for how to engage in, engage both of their senses. And maybe their senses are different. Maybe um, some music for her would be soothing and maybe some music for a toddler would be soothing and he, he or she could dance around while she nursed or something. Um, but I think there's some genius in what you're saying. I noticed, I know that the only bridge for me into ventral with the barreling toddler was through my vision. There was something about his eyes, um, that, that sense of vision for me, that was a bridge into changing my perception. The others didn't work so well for me. So we're all so unique. Yeah, and what we're creating when we want to, we're get starting to be good state trackers is that moment of noticing the straight state, no, naming and noticing it's like, and, and then creating that, it almost seems like a magical moment of that pause because it's in that moment that we allow our system, invite our system to come back into more ventral vagal and mm -hmm. there are either immediately or in reflection back on that state with that ventral vagal, the possibility for compassion, self-compassion, compassion for <clears throat> others, creativity, leaning into our senses, but we really do need to exercise and that's, that's the practice offer our systems new experience, which becomes the evidence for possibility and change. And Deb Dana called her earliest work, learning about the rhythms of regulation. Yeah. And we need that little little bit of ventral and that noticing and naming to begin to really inspire that coming mm. on board. Yeah, I'd love to write up something, um, I think maybe in the notes of this episode or in Instagram, we could put some ideas, some sensory ideas um, for mom and toddler, because I think singing would be another shared, soothing sensory exercise Yeah, yeah. Love that, that wouldn't interrupt with nursing. Mm -hmm. 
Great. So that, that leads me into the second question, ladies. And um, this again um, pertains to state tracking, but and, and separating story from state. And the question came from a listener that says, look, I have a story that's real and true. It was a trauma and I walk around with that story all the time. I can't change the story. It's true. And that story certainly on a baseline affects my state. Um, no matter what I'm doing in my day, it, it, it walks with me. So how do I work with that? How do, how does state tracking in that case, where we have this chronic trauma, um, come into play? It's a really good question, Lauren. Um, and in my experience of working with trauma, and I will say in my personal experience of working with trauma, as well as my professional experience working with trauma, those are the systems that are met with a lot of experience, usually over time, often in childhood, that really created wiring. And then that was goes very quickly. I, sensitive, reactive are, are terms, it's like, everything's fine and everything then in a big way is not fine. And the speed of which our wiring takes us from the moment into a, a, an adaptive survival response, a, a state of protection. And then equally quickly, the brain is trying to attach a story. We have the intensity first. We have the speed of our autonomic nervous system taking somewhere in our experience, demanding that protective state. And then Essentially, the brain is finding the story that matches that intensity. We will not change history, but we can begin to have influence and change our relationship to that, where it goes so quickly. We don't, pause, what's that? It's a, it's a nanosecond, and, and then I'm there again. And, and, and the story is saying, there I am again, there I, and even if we can start to increase that that influence of, of that pause. Oh, I just went there again, I'm here again. It's like, no, hey, do I, does this moment really need? And sometimes the story, because it happens so quickly, is our, our little flag that the state has shifted quickly. Mm -hmm. That's and, interesting. And we accept it. But the moment, whether it's before story, the state always precedes story, or maybe we went so quickly to story, we went, okay, wait a minute, what, what just happened here? And that's that moment of that beginning to allow more ventral vagal and curiosity. And often with state shifts that are so quickly like that, we, we want to just go, even if we, that noticing that curiosity, what just happened? Where, or I, I just went there again, but anything that occurs is through a, a gentle interruption. It's like, oh, there I am again, uh, you know, in, it could be coming back to your senses. It could be beginning to have new possibilities of naming and noticing. And, and that's the moment that, that that influence, yeah. I think there's a big piece of state tracking <clears throat> that has to do with our development of our interoception. And uh, this sort of goes back to what we've talked about in the past where um, there, we have the facts of our life, and then we have the felt experience of our state. And often those two things, um, you know, the, the part of our brain that's processing that past experience doesn't, un, doesn't process time. So it can feel very present, even though something happened in the past, it feels like it's with us, it's with us, even in the present moment. Um, but if we can tune in to our felt experience of it. So as Lauren was just talking about with our senses, um, where in our body are we feeling it? How does our digestion change? How does our temperature change or our heart rate or our breathing? Or um, do we feel like we wanna do something about it? Or do we feel like all of a sudden we are glued to the chair and we can't move? And just 
noticing what's happening internally for us and what the felt experience of it is will really help us track the state and also offers some clarity into uh, what might help us welcome some ventral in. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing from both of you that for this listener is <clears throat> we can't change the story. The story, the trauma is going to be there. We don't need to even work directly with it. And I think this is where many of us get caught up is we think we have to address the trauma slash story or we have to work with it. And what I'm hearing you both say is um, the healing occurs when we look at what that story caused, what the state, the experience, the felt experience. And, and Cameron, you're saying if we can catch ourselves in those small here I am again moments, each time we do that and then invite in some ventral energy and to um, bring in what is needed to shift our own personal state, then we're, we're, we're healing. That's a healing moment. So the healing isn't happening back here. It's happening in the present moment. Yeah. We never really successfully struggle and win with a struggle. And that, that old <laughs> wiring that was necessary is always going to be there. But a wonderful thing about the autonomic nervous system, that particular response dealt with the need for survival at that time, but it's very taxing in terms of energy and in terms of that sense of stuckness and what, what it took to go there and go there frequently. That given the opportunity that old wiring sits there, but those those little brief interruptions that that new information is it layers on new wiring and the autonomic nervous system really will be delighted to find ease shifting states if it can and that's as you put it lauren and, and megan too that's where that possibility of play or that possibility for healing happens with the new experience which involves being able to learn how to have that moment of pause and shift into inviting more ventral vagal energies. Like, even if it is, it's me, it's like, whoop, I, this morning when I was getting ready to, to come to our time together, I wa was able to watch myself. I had a tiny piece of, you know, ventral vagal's like, here I go again. I'm starting to get really mobilized. And instead of going to the store, I'm going to be late. And then I'm going to be all, you know, wigged out. I'm like, I got to, to sort of smile at myself because I didn't need to go into the old wiring. I could afford with that, that practice and that new experience. Like, yeah, I imagine my cat was laughing at me as I'm zipping around the house, as opposed to like, oh, this is bad. That's that old wiring that's the, the going into the struggle and the, the moments of possibility. Cameron, something that you said earlier, I think is so important and worth repeating which is that story follows state. State comes first. And I think it's easy to say, oh yeah, yeah, but most of us are actually running under the assumption that it works the other way, that the facts of our life or the stories that are running in our minds all the time are determining our state. And I think that that is because that's where we're giving most of our attention is to the story. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging it. No one's denying that. The facts of our life are real, but I think if we just shift a little bit of our attention onto the state through our interoception, through getting in touch with our senses, through paying attention to what we're feeling, we might actually start to notice what Cameron is describing to us, that it works the other way. And that when we can be aware of our state, we will notice the relationship that the story will then come when we're in a certain state. And that when we can shift that a little bit, we can free ourselves, even if it's just for a second um, from being in that story 24 hmm. seven, small incremental changes. It's a practice. Yeah. 
You know, ladies, this this brings me right back to my hike in the mountains in France that I shared. And when you say small incremental changes, I mean, each time, each hike I took, there were small inter small changes. But in this particular one, there was this huge breakthrough. And, and I think I, I want to bring this back to really encourage our listeners is the breakthrough only happened because of the incremental changes that were um, added along the way so that each time I found myself in that story of I'm going to be lost and cold and hungry and um, eaten, you know, I, and it, it's never about eaten by bears. It's the lost cold and <laughs> totally in my core, right? And um, so I'm out there on this sunny, beautiful, gorgeous day with this beautiful scenery, yet the felt experience, the state starts coming of a racing heart, a little shortness of breath and to catch and go, wait, look where you are. <clears throat> Use your senses, right? Look, see this. I'm not cold. I'm not alone. It's not dark. And this is actually really enjoyable. Um, so I think reaching out to our listener with this question and and all of our listeners, it is it it's not the heavy lifting work that we think that um, heals trauma. And somewhere we have been told or come to believe that it's work and I have to get in there and unpack this. I, I've heard that so many times, this, I have to work on myself or I have to unpack all this old, and, and that's not what I'm hearing at all from either one of you. And it is so not been my experience. Um, it's, it's actually like magic. Um, it's magic that happens when we do these little baby steps. Yeah, to sort of um, come full circle to where we started with new baby and toddler. Uh, I just had this thought, uh, Lauren, as you were describing the hike and incremental small steps, which was with my second child, um, I had stalled labor. So many um, moms listening to this know what that is. You know, you're in labor for a short time and then your labor just stops and it stalls. And I tell you what that was. The last thing that I wanted, it felt counterproductive to me. I was done being pregnant. Things weren't going as, uh, the script wasn't going as I wanted, as is the nature of life, right? But um, actually, he was delivered um, 20 minutes after labor restarted, pretty much. And what I realized uh, afterwards was that that stalled labor uh, was so productive. And these tiny little incremental steps were happening, even though I wasn't in pain. And it didn't seem like I was in quote unquote labor. Again, I felt like, I, you know, it wasn't work in that moment, yet it was so productive. And it was exactly the opposite of what I thought was happening. So when you feel like your healing process is installed labor, uh, fear not. <laughs> something's happening. Oh, Megan, that is fantastic. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Ladies, as always, it's been such a joy to be with you. And I, I think we've done a remarkable job at uh, addressing these two questions. Are there any closing comments from you, Cameron, on state versus story? Uh, it's, uh, it comes from the heartfelt experience um, with what Megan's saying too, is we're meaning making creatures. Somehow if we figure it out, we can fix it. And we go into that struggle when in fact, if we can attune not to the story, which story inevitably intensifies the struggle. Oh, here I went again, oh my goodness is very different than that gentle interruption of, oh, maybe maybe the 
healing is happening. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, it's right below my awareness now, but my, our systems are always working toward healing and we somehow just need to get out of their way sometime. And, and, mm, beautiful. Yeah. I really want to thank the two listeners um, who are participating with us in this exploration of getting to know ourselves and our autonomic nervous systems. It's really so fun when the conversation opens up and um, those of you listening are part of it because you're with us all the time and uh, we love it when uh, we can engage you like this. Yeah. Thanks for offering that up, Megan, because I would like to invite all of our listeners to um, share their questions with us. We have a, an Instagram account going right now, How We Heal podcast. Mm -hmm. And um, you can instant message on there and share your questions that way or contacting each of us through our websites, cameronscottma.com, acculimp, dot com or lauren at lauren Huvale or lauren Huvale dot com excuse me and we look forward to hearing more from you and con continuing on on this how we heal path thank you ladies mm -hmm.